Namaste and welcome to Future Leaders, produced by today's Youth Asia. In the TV show Future Leaders, we discuss visionary ideas, talk about innovations, inspire youth leaders and nurture concerns for a better world. My name is Shruti. In today's episode, we have with us Dr. D. Aker. Dr. D. Aker is the Deputy Director of John B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice, IPJ, and Program Director for IPJ's Nepal Peace Building Initiative. She is a conflict resolution professional, facilitator, educator, and psychological anthropologist working in conflict and post-conflict communities. She created and directs IPJ Women Peacemaker Programs and IPJ World Link Youth Program and she has worked in Central America, Africa and Asia with parties in conflict. She is the former university president and freelance journalist who has documented hundreds of stories of women caught in conflict and working for peace. We also have with us Dr. Donald M. Gragg. Dr. Donald M. Gragg completed his MD degree from McGill University, Montreal, Canada. He also holds PhD degree in higher education from Michigan State University. He has 23 year long naval career where he also worked in medical education designed with U.S. Navy and Department of Defense based in Bethesda, Maryland. He was also inducted into Ranco Bernardo Hall of Fame in 2008 recognizing his years of leadership in local volunteer organizations. Being doctor by profession and working in the Navy how did you get the idea of working with a drug abuse? Well, I, it was from my own recovery. And when I, when I got into recovery and stopped drinking, I immediately started working in, in a, and being co-leading a group of doctors and medical students in recovery and working as a consultant in a treatment program. So when I retired from the Navy, I decided to go into working in uh, the treating uh, the addictions, and I spent uh, 11 years uh, just doing that uh, kind of medicine, that field of medicine, and uh, it's been a great and very rewarding career. I've I've uh, shifted careers many times during my uh, my lifetime, from from nuclear submarines to uh, internal medicine to medical education, into the addictions, and into adult education and international. Uh, uh, affairs, but uh, I enjoy new things and uh, feel, hope that I've made some small contribution in each of these many fields. I've, I've written a, uh, an autobiography of sorts uh, that I call My Venturesome Life, and it's, uh, I've had uh, lots of ventures, some here in Nepal, and I'm still doing them. What would you like to suggest to those youngers who are already involved in drugs? Well, the first step is to recognize that th there's a problem. Um, and I, I assume from the way you phrase the question that at least there's an inkling that maybe they've got a problem. Uh, learn about it. Uh, find someone who's in recovery. Uh, there are self-help groups. There are treatment programs. The, the important thing is to ask for help. The, uh, I think all of us who ever got addicted thought we could take care of it ourselves. And that's uh, the, our immediate reaction to be defensive, to say, well, I can handle it. It's not a problem. Uh, well, in reality, most people can't handle it. They have to reach out for some help somewhere. And there's help out there. I don't know exactly where it is here in Nepal, but I don't think you'd have to hunt very far before you could find it. I know there are a couple of Alcoholics Anonymous groups here in Kathmandu uh, that uh, you can just Google uh, and find out uh, how to contact them. Uh, the Internet has lots of access to places that can give you help. Sir, how important is the family of the abuser during the recovery phase? How important is the family? Well, uh, tremendously. And the, the family needs help also, as well as, as the addict. Uh, it unfortunately, frequently the addiction has reached the point where the family 
may be detached or uninvolved or not even care anymore. Uh, but it's important for those that are important in their life, be they family or otherwise, to be understanding and supportive and also to recognize uh, the role they play in the interaction because addiction isn't a solo activity. Uh, the, uh, everybody around the, the addict gets involved in the addiction one way or another. And if they don't change along with the addict, uh, it becomes dysfunctional again. So that uh, they are, there are programs to help the family. The family needs to be involved to the degree that they're willing to be involved. Ma'am, where do you think the peace process of Nepal is heading towards? That's a really good and interesting and complicated question because there are so many factors that can't be determined. If you look in the long process, I've been involved since 2001, actually, when we worked with some of the political parties and uh, et cetera. And it's, there's obviously been a change. I mean, there are not 13,000 victims anymore. I mean, that number hasn't increased. Um, there is work, slow as it is, for some kind of constitution. Um, but the reality is there are a lot of people who are impatient. There are a lot of people who are frustrated by the process. It's a really interesting place right now because some people now are beginning after the long years of not having any access to outside world or funding or tourists coming through, etc. So it gives kind of a sense for some people that things are, are okay. Uh, whereas the people who really want to see other things change, like the infrastructure really gets stronger, like the constitution be written fairly and followed after it's written so that it includes all the people in the Tarai as well as uh, you know the mountainous areas, that's more complicated even though there are 601 people in the, and 40 however many ministers now. Um, so it's, it's a little unclear what the future is. Obviously the hope, the energy, the commitment, and especially the role and the voice of young people and women and people who want the change. Journalism is extremely important in this time. How you cover it, what you ask people, how you bring forward what they really want, and then how to pressurize uh, or pressure, you know, those people who are representing. A lot of people don't know how to use representatives. I've often spent time in villages. They didn't know how after a person was elected. I was when I was here for the elections, if a Maoist was elected in one area, Nepali Congress people said, Well, it's over, I'm not going to do anything. I said, No, no, that's your representative now. That person you have to learn how to use the person that's elected. It's an interesting uh, concept when you haven't really done it that way before, when you've been totally dependent on a party, whatever party it was. So part of the process is going to be all of you getting really truly involved and pressuring those people who represent you to represent you, even if you didn't come from the same uh, community, class, caste, whatever. So it's hard to say, but the potential is there. I mean, obviously, potential for Nepal is profound, and the people of Nepal are so gracious and so wise when it comes to postponing the really violent uh, possibilities that I'm hopeful. Ma'am, in your opinion, what kind of co conflicts are people in Nepal, Nepal facing, be it in the personal level, level or uh, community level? Okay. In my opinion, the conflicts that people face really occur at all levels. I mean, how do we act in family? The same kind of techniques that I teach for negotiation between big political parties is the same one I teach with families, I mean, with, with people who just need to get together, or whether it's across uh, ethnic differences. I mean, that kind of clash can be, difference can be fanned by people who want power over something as opposed to power with. The trick in any conflict, whether it's at the local, national, international level, is to get people to see that they have a much greater power by working together rather than seeking power over. Power over is very temporary. I mean, that's the, that's the most primitive form of power there is, just you know, being authoritarian, just presiding in that way, just having, having gotten it by some kind of force. Um, even laws and regulations, while they're really good and it's a step forward, they're still kind of geared in a time frame 
and you have to change them. In the United States, we often talk about the fact our first constitution, thank heavens, it's as flexible as it is. Because the reality is we had slaves, women had no vote, we were, you know, we were treating our indigenous people terribly. I mean, the, the United States was at that time. But all that could change through the kind of constitution that we created, which was really important. But the really most positive form of communication that will build the government and solve these conflicts that you want is actual cooperation, power with people, really seeing the advantage, no matter what your historical position was, no matter what your race, gender, et cetera, was. It's coming together and solving a problem together, because that actually lasts. And it's forward thinking, because you can solve problems as they come up. So what plans do you have for drug and alcohol-related issues in Nepal? Well, I am going to be meeting with uh, a group of volunteers in the Trai uh, next week uh, to discuss with them the approach to uh, instituting uh, a treatment program for addictions there. Uh, it's, it's a challenging uh, process, uh, but it's a very rewarding and a very necessary one. And I'm, I'm delighted that there are a group of volunteers who are anxious to uh, take on that task, and I wish them well. Do you think there are prospects for Nepalese women to develop like the women in your country? Well, two parts to that question when, when I hear it. Are, are there a chance for women to develop in Nepal? Yes. I mean, in multiple ways. In many ways, many of women I've met here are far more developed, especially young women in terms of being engaged, trying to change things. This whole program, Today's Youth Asia, and, the, and the, the role of women on television and taking responsibility and asking the good questions, that's really good. In terms of, in relationship to my country, I actually see us learning from you. One of the things we're going to be doing is showing some of the interviews we do here with young women to our students, to our uh, young women who also need to develop. It's not automatic. Every generation, every group of people has to really be interested and committed we have a lot of successful women, but it's not absolutely the norm that they're somehow brighter or better or have more success than some of the women I've met here. Certainly a member who started amazing NGOs or, or business or the business women here. So I wouldn't compare them, but, I'm, but the answer is yes, you can do anything. So what do you think are the roles of youths like us to eradicate the problems of alcohol and drug abuse? Well, I am sorry to say I don't think alcohol and drug abuse are going to be eradicated. Uh, but they can be diminished. And I think the role you play is that of a role model. That is to not uh, be a bad uh, or inappropriate user of chemicals and uh, uh, whether you choose to use them at all or not, I think is a personal choice. I, uh, I like uh, to frequently say that anyone who, who tries alcohol or drugs and enjoys it is in trouble, uh, that uh, they're likely to become an abuser. Uh, those who don't like it are lucky. They don't have to worry, uh, hopefully. There, actually, there are some people who force themselves to use it uh, uh, until they're in trouble, but that's, that's uncommon. The biggest thing is to be a role model and to let your friends and colleagues know that they're having a problem. When they're having a problem, don't look the other way. Don't say, that isn't my position. If you see somebody starting to get in trouble or behaving inappropriately because of, of alcohol, let them know it. You may need to wait until they're sober uh, for them to hear you. Uh, and they won't like hearing it, but that's what needs to be done. And good luck. Since alcoholism, smoking, and drugs are not good, but still our government has done not, almost nothing, nothing to control to stop this problem. So, what what role government can take that will help this problem? Let me start by uh, telling you my view on what or who government is. You are government. Uh, you are the people. Uh, I, I think it's coming in Nepal, at least. I know it didn't used to be that way necessarily, but, 
but you now have representatives and you they are supposed to be your voice and you are the their information source so if if you think that the government should do something uh, you need to let them know that because that's you are the government uh, you know you're a small part of the government but you are you are the government uh, the, it's not so much what the, the government can do things, uh, but even if they're rules, even if they're laws, they're, they're not enforced. In California, we have a law that you're not allowed to drive while talking on a cell phone. Huh. You, a third of the people driving are talking on a cell phone. Uh, it, you can't enforce it because the people aren't ready for it. Government can pass laws, but they have to be enforced. And for them to be enforced, the people have to really want them. If everybody or, or the majority of the people don't believe that it's wrong to talk on a cell phone while driving, you can pass all the laws in the world. People will still talk on a cell phone and drive. But the first step is to have a law. The first step is to get enough public support for that, for not smoking in restaurants, for example, for not selling alcohol to people under 18 or 21 or 65 or whatever age you want to pick. Uh, you can pass the law. You can try to enforce it. But you have to have a, a significant proportion, and I think a majority of the people, who believe that's right for it to have any effect. So don't pass it off to the government. We all are responsible. So in many parts of Nepal, especially in the Tarai, farmers have been growing and trafficking drugs for their family as the source of their family income. How can this fundamental be eradicated if the farmers themselves are the abusers and they're using it in order to earn their family income? That's a tough one. It's a real hard problem. First of all, if raising drugs, marijuana or heroin or opium, uh, are the best way they can support their family, they're going to do that. Uh, we, you, they need to learn a new way to support their families. Uh, I've not been to the Terai yet, but as I understand it, uh, it's wonderful land, very fertile. They could grow lots of things. And if you grow vegetables, you have to get the vegetables to the market. And if the road is so bad that your tomatoes become tomato juice before they get to the market, they'll, they're likely to grow marijuana, which they can get to the market without it being destroyed. Uh, I understand that, that some, something around a third of the crops in India spoil before they can get to the market because of lack of transportation. I'm sure that Nepal is, I don't know the statistics for Nepal, but I imagine it is, is similar. Uh, so that what can you do to get the, the farmers to stop growing drugs? It may be to pave the roads. I don't know, but it may be. That that, that is, is how big the problem is. Ma'am, for me, justice is like Newton's third law of motion. Every action has equal and opposite reaction. But in context of our country is going something elsewhere. I meet a constitutional assembly member week before. She was a woman. And she is shouting for we need 50, 33% vote in our constitutional assembly. But like what I would like to say her is that what is she working first? Is she working for 33% seat in constitutional assembly? So what IPZ, International Peace Justice, as you are a maker of that, what do you like to suggest her? I think you're absolutely right. What somebody really wants, if, it, if, it's, if it's just an idea, if it's 33% or 40%, you know, and in, in a lot of people around the world are saying that there should be a 40-60 relationship in every, gov every government, not whether it's male or female, just 40-60. Nobody gets more than 40%, I mean, less than 40, and nobody gets more than 60. Could be either way. Could be 60% women, 40% men. But it isn't the issue 
it, when you're writing the Constitution that has to be the center, the Constitution are these, these concerns about setting up some system that will actually allow you to solve the problems. It doesn't make any difference whether you're men or women. We live in families. We live in communities. Everybody has res rights and responsibilities. And so what you need to know from your woman legislator, if you have one, is what is she really working for? What, what committee is she on? Is she working on human rights? Is she working on the actual uh, wording of the Constitution for, uh, are you going to include environment as some new constitutions are around the world? And what is she working on? You need to work with her on that, find out what she's doing, and then decide if you really want to support her. And if she's not, you need to get the community around you. As Donna said, it's the people's government, and you have to go to the uh, persons representing you and really give them your thoughts, your interests, your concerns. Um, in an ideal world, I think we'd have the 40-60 relationship because it's important for voices to be heard. In reality of setting up a system and a new constitutional government, I don't think that that's the key issue. The key issue is what do people want in that constitution that will make a better community for everybody, men and women. What if she doesn't know what to work? She doesn't know how to ask her rights. So what do you like to suggest her for that? Okay. That's a really good question. If she doesn't know, she doesn't know how to do this. One of the constitutions that I watched being written, I spent 18 years covering Uganda and watched them write their constitution. Uh, it may have problems now. It's not the constitution. It's the people who ended up in government. But the constitution itself is an amazing constitution. And how it got written was having... In, in their case, they also had a certain number of women who were involved, expected, expected to be elected to represent uh, different constituencies. Now, women who were, some of the women who were elected didn't have a clue because they were only there because they were elected because they had to be included. What they actually did and how they set this up is that a group of women lawyers were working behind the scenes so that women legislators could actually learn, have the facts, what needs to be done, how is this working elsewhere. They actually fed them the information so that there was a support system. So if you have a woman's legislator who doesn't know how to do it, you need to give her the, pos the support system she needs. She needs to hear your voice. She needs the support of people who are good at figuring out how legislation works or how laws work or how things or systems are set up. And the other issue was that they did in Uganda, which was so interesting to me, was that a lot of these women who were elected and sent off were, fam were mothers of young children. Well, it's not normal for, the, for somebody who hasn't in the past to run off to go to a legislature, but they were assigned. That's what they, they were elected, and they wanted to do it, but it was hard. So they also set up systems to make sure that the children were taken care of so the women could focus. They could have the support to know what they needed to know that they hadn't known before. They had the support system to help them with their families so they could work. And they had the support of the other citizens back home that they had actually gone out and campaigned in front of. The system was then that everybody who ran for, for an office, they would campaign side by side, whether it was four people or ten people or two people, in front of the same audience at the same time. It's something I wish we had in the United States, to be perfectly honest, not just by parties representing. Because I think it's possible, if we think it through, and if you all, as young people, can look at the support systems needed to help your people who are, you know, writing the Constitution or are working in government, it really, it really can think it through. You can help them. With this, we have come to an end of today's show. Thank you very much Dr. D. Aker and Dr. Donald M. Grab for being with us today and sharing with us your insightful thoughts and ideas. Thank you for being with us. We look forward for your feedbacks. Our email address is youthtya at the rate gmail.com. We hope to see you next week. At the same time, have a nice week. Namaste.